Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language. But the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verses 1. Now the Bible says, Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. While the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Now here youth is not necessarily age. Okay? Verse 2, while the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rain, in the day when the keepers of the house shall tremble, and the strong men shall bow themselves, and the ground has ceased because they are few, and those that look out of the windows be darkened, and the door shall be shut in the streets when the sound of the grounding is low, and it shall rise up at the voice of the bird and the daughters of music shall be brought low. Somebody shout hallelujah. When you read Ecclesiastes 12 without revelation, it sounds like a scripture of prose and poetry. You're like a student in a literature class. But when God gives you understanding of this wonderful text, it's amazing the things that are in the Bible. And I pray by God that may God give you the full understanding of the words that are going to be spoken tonight. I have always mentioned many times you've heard me speaking about certain things and certain ideas concerning windows. And some to ask what are windows? What is the meaning of windows? Where do they come from? Why do you keep mentioning these things? And some have clues and some don't. Hallelujah. And today I came to talk about windows. Hallelujah. The windows of the Spirit. Because I've realized we mentioned them, but not many of us have the full understanding of what they mean. Because in the Spirit realm, there is such things as windows and such things as doors. These conversations are for the mature, or at least for people who hunger to grow in the things of the Spirit, who don't deal with God as a transaction, but are positioned to know God eternally. And the Bible says this is eternal life that we might know the one true God and his son, Jesus, whom he has sent. Now in Galatians chapter 6 and verses 8, the Bible says that he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh with corruption. But the Bible says, but he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. So away, the life which is of God, the life which is in God himself. The life that carries the very essence of God, he says. Now, tonight is one of those sermons that deeply teach you to sow to the Spirit. When you learn to sow to the Spirit, the Spirit realm will be very kind to you. And when it's very kind to you, the physical realm will become so easy for you. The Bible says in Hebrews 11:3 that by faith we understand that the worlds, the eons, the ages were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. That means the things which are seen are made of things which don't appear, that are not evidently seen with your physical eye, yet they exist. And they are things also, even though they are not seen with your physical eye. 
He says the eons, the ages, the periods of time, the opportunities of experience, they were framed by the Word of God. So the essence of the Word of God, in practical sense, is to give you opportunity to seize your time in the Spirit. When you seize your time in the Spirit, your success will not be an accident. Your success will be duly intended, calculated and deliberate to the glory of God. Somebody shout hallelujah. Now to take your eyes off the carnal thought of Ecclesiastes 12, to look at it from the spiritual perspective, when he says remember thine creator, he means fix your mind on your creator in the days of thine youth. Now, like I said, he's not talking about just the physical youth life. He's talking about the most active life, even of your spirit. Somebody shout hallelujah. Because in the physical realm, when you are a youth, the age of youth is the most active time of human existence. And so it is spiritually. So here, he's not talking about the physical youthfulness. He's talking about the spiritual youthfulness. The beauty with the things of the spirit, you can stay youthful. The Bible says he renews our youth. Somebody shout hallelujah. He renews our youth. The life of Christianity is not supposed to be a life where you shift from youth to old. You understand? Your youthfulness by the grace of God is supposed to be renewed such that you are active until the day you leave this world. Somebody shout hallelujah. That's why I always tell you we can never go to the grave empty. Some of us have too much. Even if we had a thousand years to live, we'd still have too much. Somebody shout hallelujah. Because this infinite God had placed infinite things in our finite bodies. We are endless. We are bottomless. Somebody shout hallelujah. Because we are of his government. And of him there is increase. Somebody shout hallelujah. I will be deep in 20 years. I will be deep in 30 years. I will be deep in 100 years. I will be relevant. Somebody shout hallelujah. Even when I'm long gone and they listen to my sermon, they will be like fresh manna. Every time they listen to it, it will release a different light. For the Bible says, for in thine light we shall see the light. The ability of a minister is not only to give light, but for men to see light in the light given. Somebody shout hallelujah. That is the essence of revelation and the progression of divine purpose. And that is where God has called you. You might not stand on the pulpit, but wherever the Lord has placed you, whatever he has placed on your life, it is eternal and it shall stay sustainably relevant in the generations to come. If you believe that, shout amen. So he speaks of evil days that come. Know the years that draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. He's talking about the likeness of men which lose the wonder of the things of the Spirit. And sometimes they lose the wonder of the things of the Spirit. Not because God ceases to wonder, but because in familiarity comes invisibility of the things that should be visible but because they are familiar our eyes skip these things it's like if you live in a room full of chairs tables your bedroom your living room wherever home you live a pen can go missing off your table and you don't know that that pen is missing and it has been sitting on that table for weeks why because it is familiar you understand what i'm saying and sometimes Many things in the things of God become so familiar. And when they become so familiar, they start to become invisible. Sadly, even for Christians, many people don't know how to keep the wonder. You understand? And because they don't know how to keep the wonder, they cannot provoke the essence of God to continue pouring out more for them. Why? Every time they say, I know that, they seem to imply they cannot be more than what they think they know. And that holds back the spirit from being able to fully minister to you 
the way you should. Some people, in their earlier years of life, when they're babes, they're fascinated, like a toy car given for the first time in a two-year-old's hand, and he plays with it. And then one day, the car is no longer nice. Then he throws it away. You understand what I'm saying? And they think that that's how God is. Unfortunately, that's not how God is. All scripture is profitable. You understand what I mean? What I mean to say is never lose the wonder. Because I've seen people who lose the wonder because of what starts to look to them as familiar. And then they start to have a false hunger to seek for things they will never find. When you find them, they look like they're hungry. But they never seem to find what they're hungry for. And they will die hungry because they left the wonder in what started to look familiar to them. Never get familiar to the presence. Never get familiar to the word. Never get familiar to the things of the spirit. Always wake up like a child ready to wonder. Childlike faith. Always expect them that even in the simplest things, the thing repeated a million times, God will always speak to you. When you keep your spirit that way, it's amazing the things he will tell you. If you've understood it, shout amen. And so now we have a problem because we don't know anymore how to minister to those which skipped the wonder because it started to look familiar. Because there is no provision scripturally to minister to such men. You understand what I'm saying? There is no scripture that can minister to such men. Because their eyes have started to see God the wrong way. He that comes to him must know that he is. But who is he? You understand? Who is God? Who is God? And it's sad that such people over time start to look like they are deep because they seem to have transcended certain wonders but they never have the results of that depth because God is still in the simplicity. And that's how you know that men are corrupted. That's why Paul prays like Satan beguiled Adam and Eve through the subtlety. He says that you should not be corrupted from the simplicity which is in Christ. It's a huge corruption to be taken away from the wonder in seeking what you might never find because he's not there where you think he is. It's amazing how the human mind plays men. Somebody shout amen. And so we see some of whom seem old and they say, I have no pleasure in the things of God. There are people who have been in salvation for 20, 30 years, 40 years. 15 years, some even three, and they're already tired. And sometimes you ask yourself, what have they seen to get tired? Or oh, accept what they saw as a mirage. What they saw as a delusion of the real thing. And because they could speak it from their mind, they thought that their spirits would articulate. God is so wonderful. The older you grow, the older you should love him. Somebody shout hallelujah. There's a difference between being old and ancient. They almost sound like the same, but there's a difference. The ancient keeps its precision. It keeps its language. It keeps the understanding. It keeps its youthfulness. Because it continues to be relevant. And that is why I pray that you may continue to be relevant. If you understand it, say amen. Now in verse 2 he says, While the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened. And here he talks about vision. Because the sun, the moon, the stars are all illumination. And he's talking about the vision of light. And here we're not talking about the physical light. We're talking of the light that comes through the glorious 
gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We're talking about the light that represents itself as knowledge. In other words, knowledge is not deemed at that time, and the clouds return not after the rain. It's talking about the depression and tears that follow men who are not founded and established in the understanding of the Spirit. In fact, if you read the Amplified of that in verses 2, he says, Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened, sight is impaired, and the clouds of depression return after the rain of tears. He's talking about a life where some people live, they are happy today, they've overcome something, and then tomorrow, you know, tears return, depression, pain, depression, pain, tears, depression. You're never happy about your salvation. God has called you to a happy life of salvation. Somebody shout hallelujah. Let's continue in the KJV. Verses 3. And he says, In the days when the keepers of the house shall tremble, and the strong men shall bow themselves. He's talking about spiritual weakness. And the ground has ceased because they are few. And here we're talking about the grinding of meat. Hallelujah. You see, when a man grows old, some people start losing the teeth that eat meat. You understand what I'm saying? And when you're so old and you lose the teeth that eat meat, you start to realize that old people start eating food like for babies because their grinders are what? Have ceased. And now God is talking about a place where you must keep the teeth spiritually that can still eat meat, that can still take in the deep stuff and you conceive it and you understand it in the mighty name of Jesus. Today we're living in a church where the things of the spirit are becoming complicated. Some people are losing their grinders very early. They can't understand the deep stuff. They only settle for what is milk. Hallelujah. So he says the grinders cease because they are few. And now the line I wanted to emphasize. And those that look out of the windows be darkened. Somebody shout hallelujah. So Ecclesiastes talks about those that look through the windows. Hallelujah. The windows. The windows. The windows. The windows. Here we're not just talking about the sun, the moon, and the stars that give you the light of the Spirit to know God as you should progressively through knowledge. We're talking about windows. We're talking about distinctions. When we're talking about windows, we're talking about consecrations. When we're talking about windows, we're talking about the things that separate you. We're talking about the things that separate your voices from the noises. We're talking about the things that give you a frequency higher than many can speak. We're talking about a language that you can have that can define your own person and give an identity to your soul as a child and minister of God. We're talking about something that gives uniqueness to the gift that you are before God. God has not called us to be cheap copies of great originals. God has called everybody to be special, to have their own distinction, their own identity, their own story, the thing that separates you. But even if a hundred people preach, you're different. Even if two million people worship, you're different. Even if 300 people prophesy, you're still different. Receive it in the name of Jesus. You cannot walk through that when you've not seen through the windows. There is meat and bread that is available for all men. The general sum of men, things everybody can reach. But there are things that are hidden. Revelation 2.17, he calls it the hidden manna. Somebody shout hallelujah. There are things that are hidden. There are things that are unsearchable. And they are available for everybody who understands, who believes. They are not for a special few. No. I'm not saying that these things are exclusive for a special few. They are available for all men. But not all are able 
to get them. Yet they are available. The Bible says, though he be not far, God is near. God is near. God is near. The problem, some people think God is far. He's not far. He can seem far in your song, but he's not far. God is near. He's near. He's near. He be not far. God is so close to you than you are close to him. <laughs> Somebody shout hallelujah. Say amen. And so we define windows. These are sort of like spiritual gates. Okay? And these sort of are like the portals. The children of God must exercise themselves in two opening or walking under them open. Are you hearing me? That the things of heaven will easily evolve and participate in your normal life, in your earthly dwelling. You get where I'm coming from? It's possible to walk under open heaven. But heavens never open over congregation. Heavens open over individuals. Even at the baptism of Jesus Christ, the Bible says when he was dipped into the water and he's brought out, the Bible says the heavens were opened unto him. Yes, there were people which were around who beheld the spectacular nature of open heaven. But heaven was not favoring them. It was favoring the man to whom they were open to. It's possible to walk under an open heaven. Somebody shout hallelujah. And heavens don't open to congregations. They open to individuals. Somebody shout hallelujah. Congregations might take part, but they'll never have the full experience of glory. That is what makes Jesus personal. Somebody said hallelujah. That's what makes faith personal. There are three times in scripture these windows of heaven are spoken about. In scripture. It's interesting that there are three times God speaks about the windows of heaven. In the first time it's spoken about God started to introduce to the church the judgments of grace. We're not talking about the judgments of grace. Many people don't understand that the judgments of God are the judgments of grace. In Genesis chapter 7 and verses 11, when God had instructed Noah on how to build an ark and it was full and the days were come, the Bible says in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the seventh day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. Are you hearing me? And the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Do you understand? That's the first time we see the windows of heaven open. And this time the windows of heaven are opening to release gushings of water of rain to fill the earth and why do i call them the judgments of god according to grace or the judgments of grace or they are the revelation of the judgments of grace remember the law first mentioned like in biblical interpretation there is a law called the law first mentioned but the first time a word is mentioned a particular word is mentioned it has a very intricate meaning if you have to search out through the eyes of revelation in the first time grace is written in Genesis, it says Noah found grace in the eyes of God. So these windows are preservers of the just. The same waters that killed men in a flood floated the man and his household to salvation. While some were sinking, because the man found grace. You know, many people never understand this thing. 
Many people think that Noah was righteous by works. But the Bible says that if it be of works, then it's not of grace. Noah finding grace doesn't mean he was the most righteous man. He just found grace. In fact, when the Bible says in Genesis 6, 8 that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, the literal Hebrew translation is the eyes of the Lord gave grace to Noah. Or grace for Noah through the eyes of the Lord. You understand what I'm saying? So when the Bible says grace, it's unmerited favor. So we cannot say that Noah was a very upright man. No wonder he would drink sometimes himself silly. You understand what I'm saying? But he was the first representation of a man that found grace before God. Do you understand what I'm saying? And we see that the men that die in the flood, you realize it was not so much a place of repentance, more of a place of enter here. Believe. God was looking for men to believe his word that he had sent. And because they believed not on the Son, the Bible says they were what? They were drowned. And that's why I said that these judgments of grace, these windows preserve the just. They preserve the just. They are there to preserve your life, that you will not sink. Somebody shout hallelujah. And what kills men is what another man floats on for salvation. But even deeper than that, the Bible says God did not forget those people in First Peter chapter 3, verses 18 to show you the full picture of God's grace. The Bible says, For Christ has once also suffered for the sins of the just and for the unjust. The Bible says that he might what? Bring us to what? To God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. He says, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, where in a few, that is, eight souls were saved. So Noah, yes, floated to salvation because of his righteousness by faith in Christ, in God. But you'd say then, how are the judgments of grace when those men perished? Uh-uh. God tells you that's not where their story ends. Peter walks by the Spirit and sees the full circle. And now we see why the long suffering of Christ is to the end for the just and the unjust. He dies for their sins. What does he do? The Bible says he goes in hell. The Bible says to the prisons, to the spirits of those which were seized in the time of Noah. When they died, their souls were preserved somewhere. And for God to fulfill the full picture of grace, he went there, preached to each one of them, and I ask people questions. Would you have the opportunity to receive salvation in prison and refuse? That is living proof that God saved the whole generation of Noah. I say that is living proof that God saved the whole generation of Noah. Yes, these ones were delayed, but he still went there. The Bible says that both the just and unjust will be brought to God. Somebody shout hallelujah. So the first time we see the windows of heaven, they open us up to the understanding of the judgments of God's grace to the just and the unjust. The second time, we are introduced to something a bit deeper concerning these windows. And we see access. And we see access twofold. In 2 Kings chapter 7, verses 1, the Bible says, Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord, that said the Lord, Tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a circle, and the two measures of barley for a circle in the gate of Samaria. Then the Lord on whose hand the king leaned, answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shalt not eat thereof. The man of God declared the prophetic utterance and said, by tomorrow 
morning. I don't care what the price is of barley. I don't care what the price is of flour. Tomorrow a measure of fine flour shall be sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. And the man says, do you mean God is going to open the windows of heaven? And Elisha tells the man, you will see it with your eyes, but you shall not eat thereof. And in this second dispensation, he's revealing to us the power that makes you a potent oracle. It changes the course of things by the declaration of your mouth. We see a man in a prophetic season who says, tomorrow this shall be and it must be. So when I talk about potent oracle, I mean that God gives authority to your words. You don't just speak. Every word you speak has the power to change an economy. It has the power to change a political system, a social system. It has power to even stop the sun if you want it to. That is the essence of this window. There is a way they establish potency in the oracle that you are. That you might not be a man or a woman with idle words. Somebody shout hallelujah. You know the Bible says you shall be judged for every idle word that you shall speak. Sometimes idle words are not wrong words. Sometimes idle words are words that are powerless. Because you speak with a mind but without the revelation enough to support the tenacity of the authority of the word that you have spoken. And may God give you grace in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. That something opens up to you that every word you speak it can only be so and not otherwise. Receive it in the name of Jesus. The Bible says that his word was with power. God has not called the Christian faith to speak words that are light. These are the same words that talk to tumors and tumors respond. These are the same words that talk to cancers and cancers leave. These are the same words that talk to HIV and HIV scatters. These are the same words that go to a crippled bone and that bone walks straight. These are the same words that speak to economies and they change in 24 hours. These are the same words that speak to stock exchange markets and some go down and some go up. These are the same words that speak to technology and technologies advance for your favor. These are the same words that speak to the land and nations and nations respond and yield forth their fruit and their substance to you these are the same words that speak to wombs and they bring out children and give birth to nations these are the same words that speak to generations and leave an inheritance for children and children's children potency in the oracle the man said tomorrow morning The prices are changing at the gate of Samaria. We don't know what happened in those few hours between the time he spoke it to the time it manifested. But as truly as the Lord lives, the next day, the price of barley was so. The price of flour was so. Because the man of God had the power to change it. Imagine if you had the power to change currencies, to say that tomorrow morning the dollar is going to be at this amount of money, to know that you have the ability to say that tomorrow morning the Ugandan shilling will be here, that tomorrow morning a bag of cement will cost this, and the next day people don't know why the prices have changed, but one man with a window changed it. So we see that the windows were open because of a man's grace to access the power of potent oracle. That's the ethos of why everybody needs to walk through the windows. He says whatsoever you bind on us, it shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever you loosen on the earth, it shall be loosened in heaven. Somebody shout hallelujah. He says you shall decree a thing and it shall be so. When a man says this is going to happen and it happens, I want you to know that man has a window that is open to him. And heaven is available to respond on his behalf. Somebody shout hallelujah. It's from the simplest things. 
But even in the slightest word spoken, there is power enough to evoke the result that you have spoken. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above that which you dare to ask or think according to the working power that worketh in us. Somebody shout hallelujah. Say it is mine in the name of Jesus. And the third time it's spoken about, he's talking about the thing that shapes you to be a seed of blessing, a source of blessing, and not just the receiver of it. He says, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house, and prove me now where he is. He says, said the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall be no room enough to receive it. Now remember, the Hebrew word there for blessing is not baraka, which is to bless you. It's barakao. It means to be a source of blessing. Listen, source of blessing, a seed of blessing, a gift in your generation. Hey, did you understand what I just said? Now, when he says, listen, I will pour out the ability to be a source or a gift in your generation and he adds that there shall be no room enough did you understand what he just said that there shall be no room enough it means god wants to pour something on you that nothing can contain it if it's a building you'll overflow it if it's an economy you override it you're not just blessed, but you carry a source of, you are a seed of, you are a gift, are you hearing me, that carries too much, that no room is enough. When there is no room enough, it means you benefit everybody. That you can still bless the whole world and still have enough to bless Mars, Jupiter, Uranus, and the universe. That you have more than your generation. That even in the next thousand generations, if Christ is not yet back, you still don't have enough room. Paul, by the end of his ministry, he says, I've run my race, I've finished my course, I'm now like a cup that is ready to be poured out. He says, for I am offered like a sacrifice. My time of departure is at hand. It means I'm in the overflow. Anybody that treats me will be blessed. That's why we still read Paul. Somebody shout hallelujah. And this can only carry its definition, its edifice in the spirit of revelation how do you treat revelation does it come to you to buy a house does it come to you to get you a job does it come to you to get you a man does it come to you to get you a promotion does it come to you to enhance your career does it come to you because you need a million dollars or does it come to you because you are a source without room enough And listen, he continues to say, and I will rebuke the devourer. When you're in that realm, you don't rebuke devils. When they come on you, God says, this one, ah, 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 this one don't touch. Go play with others, not this one. I'm not saying they don't attack. I'm only saying God will make them that their attacks will not have any consequence. Let me tell you, there are people, God has given too much, too much, too much, that even Satan knows that those ones you don't touch. May he rebuke the devourer for your sake. It means he just thinks about you. And he tells cancer, don't touch that one. When accidents come, 
He says on that one, uh uh-uh. The revelation in her is still necessary for 2020. That is why you will not die foolish deaths. I don't care what is in your body. I don't care what they say. I don't care who says that they say. That is why you will not be buried. Or if you're buried, they will only bury a seed. It will come out of the plant. Now to him who is able. Somebody shout amen. He says, I will rebuke the devourer for his sake. And he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, pastors. What are the fruits of our ground? People. That means Satan will not touch our ministries. If you're a business person, Satan will not touch your company. If you're a student, Satan will not touch your education. If you're a career person, Satan will not touch your job. One time a woman came in my office and said, there's this boss who has given me hell. I asked her, is your conscience clear before God? She said, yes. You've never done anything to him. He said, yes. I told her, I feel in my spirit that one we should fire. That one. I don't know why for that one God felt it that way. Usually we pray salvation, but this one the Lord told us, fire. She sent me a message just a few weeks after he said, Apostle, the man was fired. You can't touch the Lord's righteousness. God will rebuke the devourer for your sake. I don't know why for this particular boss, God said we pray fire. Many of them say, let's change them, change their heart. But this one, the Spirit said, this one, the prayer is to fire. Because some people must know that to be born of God is to overcome the world. Somebody shout hallelujah. Tell your neighbor, I'm more than a survivor. I'm a child of God. I have the life of God. He says, And I will rebuke the devourer, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before time in the field. Your vine will not cast her fruit before time. In other words, you will not give unripe stuff. You'll not be unprepared. You can't understand this scripture and have a miscarriage again. If you're impotent or barren, if you understand this scripture, your womb will open. It will open. It will open. Or you'll open wombs. A woman came to me. 15 years of marriage. 15. She said, Apostle, this womb has never carried life. I told her before the year ends. It was like three months to the end of the year. I told her, Gwai! Shatalaba. She gave birth recently. <laughs> Beraka, you are a source of bless. The windows are open to you. Somebody said, Hallelujah. In verses 12 says, And all nations, shall call you blessed for you shall be a delightsome land says the Lord of hosts these windows are our opportunity I always tell people it's not about how much you have it's how much you can access always never forget that always and one day if I ever get time to teach about the tithe you will realize it's more than the tenth of your salary. It's deeper, way deeper, way, 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 way deeper than many of us think. Yes, it's part of that, but it's deeper than that. Because in Malachi, remember, he says, bring all the types. He didn't say bring the types. He says bring all. The one of the salary is one. One of there are many more types. <laughs> the whole picture is bigger. 
Somebody shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. Some of you will realize that when you understand the principle of the type, it is the essence of planting life in wombs. It's more than just, I'm not talking about physical wombs now. I'm talking about spiritual wombs. I'm talking about the place where people have tangible results in every aspect. The essence of why you must understand how to respond or to how to relate or how to apply yourself to the windows of heaven is because when you have access, you will not need a prayer from a man of God. You understand? You just lock yourself up in the room and fix yourself. And you realize that windows spiritually are the only truly defined redeemers of spiritual time. Eternity literally reconstructs itself to favor every event earthly. And that is why I tell people, revelation is a spirit. It's not one deep summon. It's a constant thing that settles on a man. And once it sits on your life, the redemptive power of God is evident on you. The Bible spoke in Ecclesiastes where those that look into the windows are darkened. In other words, their sight to see through the windows are darkened. That is why he tells you to remember your creator. He tells you keep the mind of God steadfast. In fact, when the confusion happens on the earth and the doors are shut in the streets, that's why I'll teach about doors. Why when the windows darken, the doors shut. Do you understand what I'm saying? When the windows darken, the doors shut. When your access is frustrated, the opportunity cease. And if they cease either, you must find your way to see through the windows or manipulate yourself through some doors. And when you manipulate yourself through some doors, already a spirit of falsehood settles on you. Verses 8, he says, when he saw all of this, he says, when men hit shipwreck, the vanity of vanities, come, saith the preacher. And moreover, the Bible says the preacher was wise because he taught the people knowledge. And yeah, he gave good heed and sought it out and set it in order in many proverbs. And the Bible says the preacher sought to find out acceptable words that which was written was upright, even words of truth. Acceptable, the word therefore acceptable is purposeful, words that align men to purpose. Today, you listen to what men teach in church. And you understand, no wonder Christians are powerless, poor, beggarly, and dying, and enslaved. Because men are not teaching things that align people to purpose. What's acceptable, upright, and of truth. Today, churches are like shrines. It's as though men go to church to meet a witch doctor. To meet a witch doctor who just tell them a solution to their issues of marriage. And they lose the bigger picture which they have in God. When divine windows open to you, when access is available to you, your prayer changes. You start praying a certain way. Because now the realization of the responsibility that you have dawns on you finally. And you start to see that you are not called for Uganda. You are not called for Kampala. You are called for the world. I said you are called for the world. I want you to make a prayer that will open this thing over your head. Somebody speak. 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 You potent oracle, say something. 
you child of God. Tell God I need the spirit of revelation to set on my life. Come on, speak. I sense the presence of God and the power of possibility here. <laughs> Woo! Holy Spirit, I thank you. Saraba Baleko somebody's creating there is a woman creating there is a man creating there is somebody reshaping remodeling and realigning Karalele. deep call it and too deep zebra katerele baya yere baya lele kosaraba come on speak may the windows of heaven open to you May they stay open to you. They are available for you. Sarabarele. These windows are for you. God has blessed them for you. Retere karala bayete. Dore bayere. They are opening for you. Those sluices are open for you. Reba so barabala. Sirabayaka. May they favor your dreams. Make a prayer. By the time you walk off this ground, by the time you leave this ground, by the time you leave this ground, Hey! Come on, pray. Pray. Hey, you're a la bayala. My rabba katara bayele. Come on, pray. 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 Hey, Pray. The gates of heaven open. They are open to you. Sarabaya leba. Oh, your prayer opens things. Now you know. Now you know. Holy, holy, holy. Not come. I'll praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. Oh, 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 Let the dream 
God is God is healing. Those on clutches, check yourself. God is prepared. Let the tree. Let me do one thing and close. There is an anointing from the office I stand, I feel I must release now. I can't contain it. I can't go to bed with it. And to those that must receive it, it is known already. I release it. I release it. Have Holy Ghost! May God separate you from that crowd. May God separate you from the millions. May God separate you from the billions. May God separate you from the sale. Hey! Receive it! Hey! May your star shine so bright. May your eye not grow deep. May your eye carry a precision. And may you continue looking through the window. Divine strength is yours. Divine favor is yours. Divine glory is yours. Divine understanding is yours. Oh. Oh. Thank you, Lord. If you're sick in your body, God has healed you. If you're here and you've never given your life to Christ, you're not born again, and you say today, Apostle, I want to receive that God you're talking about, you're going to repeat these words as I say them. Say, Jesus, today I have heard your word. I have received your message. I believe that you died for my sins and was raised for my glory. Tonight, I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I'm born again. Amen. God bless you. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Sonero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowship at UMA Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. The narrow. Make manifest.